You know, it's sad that we have to learn these lessons all over again. You know, our great-grandparents already learned this stuff the hard way. They lived through the Great Depression. They knew what it was like to have the bottom fall completely out from under America. So in rebuilding America, the first thing they did was create the ideal conditions for a thriving middle class. They built three pillars. Pillar number one, good government, to help middle class people buy things together that we could not buy individually, like education for all our kids, uh, clean air and clean water, uh, and some insurance against tough times, a so-called safety net. Pillar number two, good employers who, whether they always wanted to or not, did pay decent wages and fair taxes. And pillar number three, good citizens, good community members who were actively involved in making America stronger and fairer, civil rights, women's rights, equal rights, and don't forget the unions. In don't forget them. Don't forget them. See, unions never stop fighting for the American dream. And they are key in any country to having a thriving middle class. Somehow we forgot that, but our grandparents never did. And they didn't stop there. While our grandparents were putting these pillars in place, they also put protections in place, guardrails, so the bankers couldn't just run the train off the tracks again and run over American families in the process. They put rules in place. They put guardians at the door to keep the big bankers from turning Wall Street into a casino and ever gambling again with America's future. Now, the first protection they put in place was the Glass-Steagall Act, which made it illegal for Wall Street investment banks to start gambling with working folks' money. And why did they do that? They did it because they loved their children, because they loved their grandchildren, because they loved us, they loved me and you. But over time, we let them down. We let those high-priced lobbyists, working for both political parties, I will say, sneak into the temple that our forebears built. And page by page, we let them tear out the wisdom and the good sense and the, 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 the hard-earned uh, hard understanding of our grandparents. And why did those high-priced lobbyists do that? Because they love us? No. They did it for money. They did it for money. They said, oh, just don't mind us. We're just going to deregulate this, make a little more money. Uh, don't mind us. Uh, we're just going to privatize this and make a little bit more money. Uh, don't mind us. We're just going to deregulate everything. Just like the 1920s. Privatize the gain. Socialize the pain. Same as before, and here we are again. Same disaster. Okay? Now, when will we learn, folks? And now, the same genius folks who helped to create this mess say, well, nothing we can do about it now. Oh, well. Any suggestion you make to try to fix this mess, they howl about the deficit. But we're not stupid. <laughs> We can do math. Turns out, if we just went back to Clinton-era tax rates and Clinton-era military expenditures, we could deal with the whole deficit in about 10 years. Right? Simple as that. Simple as that. You can't fool us, right? We voted. We voted in 2008 for peace and prosperity, not war and austerity. This is a dangerous situation that we find ourselves in now. We voted for peace and prosperity. We're getting war and austerity. Why? See, it is wrong to cast this as a fight just between the rich and the poor, or just between Wall Street and Main Street, or between conservatives and liberals, or Democrats and Republicans. This is a much deeper fight, a much more important fight. This is about a very small number of very greedy people against the United States of America and the American way and the American dream and everything we hold dear. Everything we hold dear. 
and say, no way.